Okay, so um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to um, being an interviewer for Matthew Menais Skinta and uh, just to say a few words about who I'm interviewing now. Like, I do not really know where to start. Your CV is so long, it's like a separate book. But uh, Matthew is a certified clinical uh, psychologist. He's a certified act trainer and a certified fab trainer. And he specializes uh, in um, LGBT matters uh, with a focus on uh, HIV prevention. Um, he's also the editor of uh, Mindfulness and Acceptance for Gender and Sexual uh, Minorities along with uh, Ashley McCarthy. So uh, it's great having you here. Thank you for taking your time. Uh, and um, have, I, have I missed anything important that you'd like to add? Uh, no, that's great for now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's like when I was thinking about the questions is that um, uh, functional analytic psychotherapy, or FAP for short, um, covers a ground that is not really associated with behaviorism at all, at least mm -hmm. to, to most people who are not into behaviorism already. And also like in my life, for me, one of the shifts uh, that happen is to discover that behaviorism can actually have a heart. That is not only a science done on rats and pigeons and whatever, but it actually relates to very deep and meaningful, meaningful spheres of human life. Like what it means to love, to be intimate, to be courageous, to be self-aware. And I'm curious um, how it was possible that currently we can, um, as behaviorists, as behaviorists relate to those issues, but it, it might have been impossible in times of Skinner. What happened during that time frame? Could you introduce us a bit uh, to the history and to like the, the framework that we are referring to now? Well, I think, um, and this is a great inspiration for any of us who work in sort of niche corners of the field, um, I, I think that the, the conversation has always been there and it's just kind of taken time for it to evolve and really start to spread. So I think of, um, I think it may have been Ellis who published an article uh, many decades ago where he had a fear of talking to women and approached like, you know, a hundred women to uh, ask them out at Boston Commons. And um, and so I think there's always been this idea that, you know, at some level, if we think that these principles are true, then we should be able to apply them to the things that are most important to us. You know, this, is, this was yeah. the inspiration for ACT as well. And, um, and there are writings back in the 70s, at least, that I've read that um, Paul Wachtel and leaders like that, who um, have commented for a long time saying, you know, there's so much potential and human relationships and connection is so important that there has to be a way for these principles to apply. And I really think that that was the innovation of um, Bob Kohlenberg and Mavis Tsai with, uh, with FAP of, of really trying to systematically break down and think, you know, well, when we look through the lens of these rules, um, you know, of course we can add heart. Of course we can think about the ways that we feel closer together or further apart and apply this framework to it. Um, I, think, I think some of the shift as well is just um, the, the nature of our societies. You know, when, when you look back 40, 50 years, um, the average person in most countries belonged to a lot more social organizations, social clubs. We didn't have Facebook or the internet, um, especially in, in Western nations, unions were quite stronger. And so uh, people had a little bit more time off, a little bit more time to connect. So I think we've seen the rise of a behavioral focus on connection and heart and relationships and authenticity while, our, while the natural ways it would just kind of happen in our towns and villages has really been on the decline. 
So, okay. So, so, so uh, if I understand correctly, like on the one hand, you see the uh, the maturation of a like theoretical framework, and on the other, there is this side guys that due to being so hyper connected, we do not actually connect at all, at least in the same situation, like in the same way that our fathers, grandfathers, and so on, that our ancestors tended to communicate something in lost. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And this this thing that you mentioned, uh, this very important sphere of life, love, intimacy, courage, awareness. Um, you know, like when I listen to that, I also think about some um, some of criticism of, of behaviorisms that, for example, you know, this uh, um, mechanical orange type of uh, behavior change. So we have this very general, like, kind of human needs area. We have these general principles uh, of behaviorism. And here, before us, sits a person who wants to love, wants to be intimate, wants to be courageous, wants to share. And, you know, like, I've been thinking, um, to which extent uh, during a therapy would you say that we need to focus on those, like, um, how to say, uh, like kind of detached from the human level theoretical framework parts? And to which extent do we need to tailor our intervention to a single person that is in many ways uh, unique with their own learning history? With their own situation, like how do you balance between this general approach to a person and to this very individual uh, approach when you're sitting in front of a single single human being? I, at least for me, I think the beauty of behavioral approaches is, is that it's always both. Um, I have to sit with you, I have to talk with you, and get a sense of who you are as a person before I know if what you're what you're presenting to me, what you're saying to me, how you're responding to me, if this is a move toward closeness and genuineness. Um, that there's, there's no one rule. Um, if, I, if I sit down with you for coffee and it's the first time we're meeting and I'm sharing something vulnerable about my life, um, it could be, it could come across as an attempt to connect to be warmer, to be closer, uh, to have a deeper connection. Um, but let's say, let's say this is at a conference because that's usually where we might overlap. But then if you were to see me greeting every stranger like that and having a tearful moment, then you, then you might be concerned, is this, is this genuine? Is this, um, is the, you know, does, does this guy, you know, does Matthew have no filter? Is that, is this, is this a different problem? If, if I lived down the block from him, would this be overwhelming? Um, uh, would I be flooded emotionally every time we interacted? And so I think there's this evolving way as we, you know, and it's, it's really the assessment process as we get to know any individual client that, that that's how we have to cater and get a sense of, of um, what might push someone away and what might, what might draw them in. Okay. So what you're saying here is that showing love is a behavior that occurs in a certain context. Exactly. When, we, when we talk about those topics in behaviorism, it's not about bombarding a person with uh, hugs and I love you and I'm here for you and so on. It's more of like intricate. And the, the theory that you have is more of a, like a guiding thing, not, not like an either or, either I have this reinforce positive and negative reinforcements and punishments or I have a contact with a person. The contact comes first and the theory kind of helps, helps to develop that, right? Exactly. The, the theory is just a, a framework, a cradle for it, um, but then the specific actions are always going to be different. Right. Um, hugs could be a sign of closeness. Mm -hmm. But if you've told me five times that you really don't like to be hugged, and mm -hmm. I insist on hugging every time we meet, then I'm starting to get aversive. And, and I'm punishing you for being around mm -hmm. me and for trying to be close. Yeah. Um, though our, client, our clients uh, sometimes ask, 
what does psychology say about that? Is this behavior right or wrong? What should we do? There is uh, a lot of that, um, like kind of like striving to um, organize my life through, through certain rules. And what you are saying here, there's something different going on that is more important. Definitely, and it's um, and in that case, those are the places where I'd always encourage a client to think functionally. Mm-hmm. You know, is it working for you okay. in your life? Is it, um, uh, you know, when I visit my in-laws in France, we give a kiss on each side of the face. Um, if I did that with everyone I met here in San Francisco, that would seem really weird. There's, there's nothing at its heart. There's nothing about any behavior that is always on you know a bad idea always unhealthy always untrue um it's always the context it's always the context are you sensitive to the context and are you doing it in a way that works for you that mm-hmm. that people are responding in ways that um that it feels like you have some sort of control with your relationships or or okay. some ability to affect them um Staying for a moment still in the, that topic and uh, linking this uh, topic to the like the older behaviors, I'm just mm-hmm. curious if Skinner were to sit like here between us, and if he and he if he were to hear that, uh, what would he be kind of like um, disagreeing with, or maybe what would be new to him? What would mm-hmm. make him like curious about how behaviors have developed? What do you think? Um, you know, there are a lot of things when you look at Skinner's writings where I think he was a contextualist at heart. The literature was just not describing it the same way. I mean, I think if he sat in on a FAP intensive, um, I'd like to think, especially when I think of the human connection in some of his popular writings, like Walden Two and books like that, I I think he did have... Um, a passion about how behaviorism could contribute to the richness of life. And so, a, at least when I picture Skinner, I'd like to think if he went to a FAP intensive, he'd just really love the idea that these ideas are blossoming in this way and that people have um, found applications and found tools to dive more deeply into that richness. Um, I don't know why of all his books, Walden Two is the one coming most to mind. But, but um, you know, but but when I think back on reading it, I'm thinking of um, the you know the attention he paid to the ideas of having time for art, of having time for connection. That that uh, at the time were already novel, and people weren't associating with behaviorism, and um, that he very strongly felt were a part of the richness of life. And um, and was a believer that behaviorism should be applicable to this. Yeah, and you know, like I'm a, I'm asking about that because um, you know, like for me personally, this is uh, like this is the best of bo- both worlds. Uh, like as a student, I was so inspired by human like logotherapy or by hu- humanistic uh, psychologists and psychotherapists, and uh, this. And simultaneously, what here, like what behaviorist brings into that game, is kind of like quite precise, like bro, like with a broad scope, like a framework that that put that ties that together, and you know.